The sky was an unyielding shade of slate as Officer Jared Wallace drove through the deserted streets of Ashfield, a small town tucked away in the mountains. The sun had long set, but even in daylight, the town had recently developed an aura that was far from welcoming. A string of unsettling incidents had been happening, each one more bizarre than the last. It all seemed to revolve around a single mystery. People had been disappearing, but not in the usual way. They would leave behind strange, twisted messages in blood on the walls of their homes, scrawled in jagged letters and barely legible. Jared had been on the force for 15 years, and he'd seen his fair share of weird things. But this, this was different. Each message seemed to hint at something sinister within the Ashfield Police Department itself. People he knew well, like his longtime partner Charlie, had disappeared without a trace last week, mm. leaving behind only a message smeared on his living room wall. They wear the badge. They have the keys. You can't run. Tonight, Jared was driving solo, his partner gone, and his chief had insisted the night shift be carried out by individual officers to keep the peace. But something gnawed at Jared's gut some inexplicable dread that clawed its way into his chest with each mile he drove. He cruised past the Ashfield County Cemetery, shuddering involuntarily as he spotted something in his rearview mirror. There was a figure, half obscured by the shadows of the headstones, standing completely still and watching his car. He blinked, and when he looked back, the figure was gone. Get a grip, Wallace, he muttered, chalking it up to fatigue. But as he continued his patrol, things got stranger. Jared's radio crackled to life, emitting a distorted, static-laden voice. Officer Wallace, do you copy? It was his chief's voice, but there was something wrong with it, like it was coming from far away, from some dark place he couldn't quite place. Yeah, chief, I copy, Jared responded, clutching the radio tighter. There was a pause then. Wallace, go to 47 Maple Drive. Now. The line cut out before Jared could reply. Maple Drive was one of those sleepy streets where people went to bed by 9 p.m. and didn't bother to lock their doors. As he pulled up to the address, his headlights illuminated a house that looked like every other on the street. Two stories, a small porch, a neatly manicured lawn. But the front door was ajar, swinging slightly in the evening breeze. Jared approached the house, his hand instinctively going to his sidearm. The silence inside was heavy, oppressive. He stepped through the threshold, the only sound being the soft creak of his boots against the wooden floor. In the dim light, he could see that the living room was in disarray, furniture overturned, broken glass littering the floor, but his heart sank as he noticed the wall. Scrawled in dark, fresh blood were the words, They've taken the chief. You're next. The breath left his body as he stumbled back. His chief was just on the radio moments ago, wasn't he? And who wrote this? His hands shook as he lifted his radio, his voice barely steady. Dispatch. This is Officer Wallace. I need backup at 47 Maple Drive. Static. Dispatch. Do you copy? Nothing. The silence wrapped around him like a thick blanket, muting every sense, and he felt the prickling of eyes on him. Jared turned around slowly, and his flashlight beam caught movement in the corner of the room. There, in the shadows, was a figure. Pale, gaunt, with sunken eyes that looked disturbingly familiar. As the figure stepped closer, Jared's heart stopped. It was his partner, Charlie, but he looked wrong, like a hollowed-out version of himself, his uniform hanging loosely on a skeletal frame. Charlie? Jared whispered. Charlie's face twisted into a grotesque smile, lips stretching far too wide, his eyes vacant. They'll come for you too, Jared, he said in a voice that sounded like the echo of a scream. Jared backed away, fumbling for his gun, but his hands wouldn't respond. His legs felt leaden, his body unwilling to obey. He couldn't look away from Charlie's hollow eyes, couldn't tear his gaze from the dark void where his partner's soul used to be. Then the house seemed to shift around him. Shadows grew long and stretched across the walls, spiraling and contorting into twisted faces that seemed to watch him, sneering and grinning with empty eyes. He heard footsteps, more and more of them, like a dozen officers marching in unison down the hallway toward him. Jared turned his head slowly, too slowly, his body feeling frozen in time. There they were, officers he recognized, officers he'd worked with for years, all dead-eyed and silent, their faces twisted into expressions of terror and malice. They moved closer in a chilling, mechanical rhythm, their eyes never leaving him. 
Jared stumbled backward, his breath coming in gasps as he tried to process the horror that was unfolding around him. Just as they closed in, his radio crackled again. It was the chief's voice, barely a whisper. Run, Wallace. They're not who you think. In a final, desperate act, Jared tore himself from the trance, stumbling out the front door and sprinting back to his patrol car. He locked the doors and hit the gas, tearing down the empty streets of Ashfield, his pulse racing as he glanced in the rearview mirror. But the reflection staring back wasn't his own. It was Charlie's face, grinning back at him from the driver's seat. Jared swerved, slamming the brakes, sat, but when he looked again, his own face stared back, drenched in cold sweat and terror. He took deep, gasping breaths, trying to calm his heart, trying to make sense of it all. But then his radio crackled one last time. Officer Wallace, the chief's distorted voice whispered, sounding closer now. Welcome to the night shift. The radio went dead, and Jared felt a cold hand on his shoulder, squeezing hard. The last thing he heard was his own scream, echoing through the empty streets of Ashfield as his patrol car idled under the bleak, indifferent stars. The small town of Whitewater had always been quiet, a place where time seemed to pause. Tucked between the mountains and thick pine forests, it felt like a world forgotten. But there were whispers, unspoken and dark, of the Whitewater Lights. No one really knew what they were, but every year, around the same week, strange, flickering lights appeared in the woods surrounding the town. Some said they were spirits. Others claimed they were nothing more than reflections from an old, abandoned mining operation. But the elders who'd grown up in Whitewater knew the truth. They were a warning, and anyone who followed those lights never returned. This year, the strange lights began earlier than usual. People in town started noticing them deep in the forest, blinking in the twilight like a silent invitation. It was night three of the lights when a group of teens decided to go and see them for themselves. They thought it would be a thrill, just a bit of adventure, something to scare themselves with before Halloween. The group of five met at the edge of the forest, each carrying flashlights and their own sense of dread. Emma was the leader, brave, the one who'd suggested the trip in the first place. Jake, the practical joker, laughed off the stories, but made sure he was never last in line. Casey, quieter, kept glancing back toward the road, uneasy about the whole thing. And then there was Miles and Brooke, both a little skeptical, but eager to prove they weren't scared. As they walked deeper into the woods, they noticed the silence pressing in around them. There were no birds, no rustling leaves, no sounds at all, only the steady crunch of their footsteps. The deeper they went, the more the silence seemed to grow, as if the entire forest was holding its breath. And then suddenly, they saw the lights. They flickered in the distance, moving in rhythmic patterns, almost like they were calling to them. The teens stopped, momentarily hypnotized, before Emma broke the spell and urged them forward. As they drew closer, the lights began to take shape, glowing orbs of soft white that seemed to hover just above the ground, winding a path through the trees. The orbs pulsed softly, luring them deeper into the forest until the teens could barely see the way they'd come. But then, just as they reached a small clearing, the lights blinked out. All at once, everything was pitch black, and their flashlights began flickering. Jake made a joke, something about cheap batteries, but his voice was strained, tense. Then came the voices. They started as soft whispers, a language no one recognized, distant, but growing closer with each passing second. The voices echoed around them, filling the darkness with hushed tones that sounded like wind through dead trees. Emma tried to speak, to call out to the others, but no sound came from her mouth, as if the forest had stolen her voice. The group huddled together, shivering, and just as the whispers grew unbearably loud, one of the lights reappeared. But it was no longer a soft, inviting glow. It was harsh, blinding, and somehow, it felt angry. The light moved toward them, and they could finally see what was inside. It wasn't just an orb. It was a face, skeletal, with hollow eyes that seemed to burn with a cold, malevolent fire. The face opened its mouth, but instead of words, a scream burst forth, an inhuman wail that cut through the silence like a knife. The teens stumbled back, hands covering their ears, but the scream kept coming, filling their minds, drowning out their thoughts. Jake bolted, running blindly into the trees, but he didn't get far. The lights swarmed him, spiraling like a tornado, trapping him in their center. 
For a moment, he was visible within the glow, his face frozen in horror, before the lights collapsed inward and he was gone. No sound, no trace, just gone. The others screamed, but there was no echo, only the oppressive silence as the lights turned their attention toward them. One by one, the orbs moved forward, circling the remaining teens, each with a face twisted in some grotesque expression of pain and despair. They whispered over and over in a voice that was both ancient and terrifyingly familiar. Stay with us. Emma, now hysterical, tried to run back the way they'd come, but the forest had changed. The trees seemed closer together, the path twisting in impossible directions. She stumbled, fell, and when she looked up, one of the faces was mere inches away, its hollow eyes staring into her soul. She could feel it pulling her in, pulling everything she was, draining her thoughts, her fears, her very sense of self. Casey, now alone, saw the lights swarm over his friends, enveloping them in their blinding glow. He tried to back away, heart pounding, but he knew it was too late. The last thing he saw before the darkness claimed him was the twisted, lifeless faces of his friends staring back at him from within the lights. The next morning, the town was abuzz. Search parties were organized, and the forest was combed. But there was no sign of the teens, only an eerie silence that hung over the woods like a shroud. The town held a vigil. People cried. But everyone knew deep down that the Whitewater Lights had claimed more souls. And then, just as suddenly as they'd appeared, the lights were gone. The woods returned to their quiet state, as though nothing had ever happened. But for those who ventured close to the trees, especially at twilight, there were rumors that sometimes, if you listened closely, you could still hear the faint whispers calling, stay with us, a warning perhaps, or an invitation. It started with a strange smell, a rancid odor that clung to the small town of Larkfield, like a sickness. People assumed it was a dead animal caught in the sewer, or perhaps something decomposing in one of the abandoned homes on the edge of town. But soon, the smell seemed to seep into everything, the air, the water, even the food. No one could get rid of it, and no one could figure out where it was coming from. Then, people started getting sick. Uh, it was subtle at first, a cough here, a headache there, but within a few days, everyone felt it. Their skin tingled, their bones ached, and soon, Everyone in Larkfield felt like they were drowning in their own bodies. They tried calling for help, but something was wrong with the phone lines and the roads were blocked by thick, unnatural fog that rolled in every night like a wave of smoke, trapping the town in an eerie, isolated silence. Late one night, Olivia, a nurse at the small clinic, was finishing her shift. She'd been feeling the effects of the strange sickness herself, a relentless throbbing in her head that seemed to pulse with the eerie glow of the streetlights outside. She stepped out into the night, breathing in the heavy air, and noticed something strange. All along the main street, people were standing perfectly still, staring at the sky. They weren't moving or speaking, just staring, their faces pale and expressionless. Olivia's heart raced as she approached one of them, a man named Gary whom she'd treated just the day before. She called his name, but he didn't respond. His eyes were locked on the night sky, unblinking, mouth slightly open, and then she heard it, a low, droning hum, almost too low to hear but unmistakable. It seemed to vibrate through the air, through her skin, resonating in her bones. Olivia looked up, and there, hovering in the sky, were dark shapes. They were massive, barely visible against the black night, each one a twisted shadow that pulsed with the same sickly hum. They moved slowly, circling like silent predators, as if watching, waiting. Just then, the hum grew louder and the townspeople began to move. In perfect unison, they walked toward the woods at the edge of town, their feet dragging but their faces eerily blank. Olivia backed away, terrified, as one by one her friends and neighbors disappeared into the trees, swallowed by the darkness. She ran back to the clinic, locking herself inside, her breaths coming in shallow gasps as she watched from the window. The next morning, she ventured outside, hoping to find someone, anyone. The town was empty. Houses were silent, doors left open, food left rotting on plates. There was no sign of struggle, no sign of life. And the smell, the smell was worse. It clung to her, making her gag as she moved through the empty streets. Days passed, and Olivia's isolation began to wear on her. She felt the sickness spreading through her body, a relentless ache that seemed to have no end. 
She barely ate, barely slept, haunted by the memory of her friends walking into the woods like sleepwalkers. She avoided looking out at night, terrified that she'd see the shadows again. But one night, as she lay in bed, a faint knock echoed through the empty clinic. Heart pounding, she crept to the door and peered outside. Standing on the threshold was Gary, the man she'd seen that night on the street. He was pale, eyes wide, and he wore the same clothes, now torn and filthy. But something was wrong. His skin seemed stretched, sagging in places like a mask that didn't quite fit. His movements were jerky, unnatural. Olivia, he croaked, his voice raspy, hollow. They? They're waiting. Gary? Olivia whispered, backing away. What happened? Where is everyone? They're in the woods, he said, his mouth twitching into an unnatural smile. Come with us, Olivia. They're waiting for you. With that, Gary tilted his head as if listening to some distant sound. And then, as if on cue, more figures emerged from the fog. They came slowly, stepping out of shadows, each one wearing the same vacant expression, each one with skin stretched too tight, eyes too wide, mouths open in silent grins. Olivia ran, locking herself in the back room of the clinic, and barricading the door as she heard the shuffling footsteps drawing closer. She could hear their voices now, all whispering her name in a hollow, unified chant. The hum returned, louder than ever, vibrating through the walls, through her very bones, filling her mind with a cold, numbing fear. The whispers grew louder, voices overlapping, until she couldn't tell where they ended, and she began. And then she felt it, a cold hand on her shoulder, even though she was alone in the room. She turned, and there was no one there. But the voices continued, filling her head, beckoning her, and she felt her feet moving on their own, dragging her toward the door, toward the fog, toward the dark, waiting shapes. The next day, Larkfield was found completely deserted. No one knew what had happened, but the stench lingered, thick and putrid, as if the town itself had rotted from the inside out. The government declared it uninhabitable, closed off the roads, and sealed it behind barbed wire and fences. But sometimes on foggy nights, those who live near the abandoned town swear they can hear the low, droning hum carried on the wind and see figures moving in the mist, forever caught in the shadows, waiting for anyone brave or foolish enough to come close. They called it the Forgotten Floor, a mysterious 13th level hidden in the heart of the old Lakeshore Hospital, a place long rumored to be cursed. The building had been abandoned for decades, left to rot after the hospital shut down suddenly in the 1950s. Rumor had it that this floor was where the hospital's darkest experiments took place, a ward for patients too disturbed, too dangerous, or too terrifying to keep with the others. Some believe the floor didn't exist at all, a story made up to scare locals, but others claim to have seen it with their own eyes. Jack, a young urban explorer with a penchant for thrills, decided to test the legend. He'd heard the stories, the whispers of a place where time stood still, where shadows moved even when no one was around. Most were too afraid to venture to Lakeshore after dark, but Jack had never turned down a good scare. Equipped with a flashlight and his phone to document the experience, he snuck into the hospital one stormy October night, the echo of thunder rumbling outside as he made his way through the crumbling hallways. As he walked, he noticed strange things. Gurneys left in the middle of the hallways, rusted medical tools scattered across the floor, and rooms filled with broken, overturned hospital beds. Despite the obvious decay, the air was thick with a strange, metallic scent, as though something rotting had just been sealed away. He checked each door, looking for stairs or a service elevator, but every door he opened led to another empty, abandoned room. Finally, he found an old, rusted elevator in the main lobby. He stepped inside, pressed the button for the top floor, and then, almost as a joke, he pressed the button for the 13th floor. The lights in the elevator flickered, and for a moment, the elevator groaned and stalled. Then, as though obeying his silent dare, the doors creaked shut, and the elevator began to descend. The ride was far too long. Jack felt his stomach twist as the elevator rattled and groaned, carrying him down, 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 far deeper than the hospital's known floors. He was beginning to wonder if it would ever stop when the elevator jolted and the doors opened to an impossible darkness. This was the 13th floor. Jack shone his flashlight into the hallway. The walls were dark, smeared with something that looked like rust or blood. The tiles beneath his feet were cracked and uneven, 
and there was a strange dampness in the air, a moisture that clung to his skin like cold fingers. He stepped out of the elevator, feeling the heavy silence press in around him, the hum of the fluorescent lights above flickering, barely illuminating the path ahead. As he walked, he noticed strange sounds echoing through the hallway, soft whispers like distant voices, each barely audible but growing louder as he ventured deeper. They sounded like they were coming from behind the closed doors lining the hallway, low and pleading, like someone trying to be heard, but afraid to speak too loudly. He tried one of the doors, but it wouldn't budge. He tried another. Same result. The whispers continued, more insistent now, as if they were urging him to find them, to let them out. At the end of the hallway, he finally found a door that opened, revealing a dark, empty room. But as he stepped inside, his flashlight revealed something that made his blood run cold. The walls were covered in scratch marks, deep grooves carved into the cement as though someone or something had clawed at them in desperation. The markings were interspersed with cryptic symbols and words, all scrawled in what looked suspiciously like dried blood. His flashlight beam caught on the bed in the corner, still covered with restraints, as if someone had been strapped down there recently. He stepped back, heart pounding, but then the door slammed shut behind him. He whipped around, pounding on the door, but it was no use. It was sealed tight. The whispers returned, louder now, filling the room, overlapping until they became a single chilling voice that hissed, they're watching. Jack's flashlight flickered and he felt a presence behind him. He turned slowly, shining the light toward the back corner of the room map where a shadow was beginning to take shape. It was a tall figure, skeletal, its eyes hollow and glowing with a faint, sickly green light. It took a step forward, its long, bony fingers reaching out, and Jack stumbled back, his hands scrambling against the door. In a panic, he tried the handle again, and this time it opened. He stumbled into the hallway, heart racing, and began to run. But the hallway was different now, much longer, stretching endlessly in both directions. The doors on either side had been flung open, and inside each room he could see figures standing in the darkness, watching him with empty, hungry eyes. As he ran, he noticed a strange detail. Each figure was dressed in a hospital gown, their faces twisted and bruised, their eyes wide with terror as they reached out for him, mouthing silent pleas that he couldn't understand. The whispers grew louder, filling his mind with fractured, jumbled words, fragments of thoughts that didn't belong to him. He clapped his hands over his ears, but the whispers only grew louder, as though they were inside his head. He reached the end of the hallway and saw the elevator doors open. Without looking back, he ran inside, pressing the close button frantically. But just before the doors shut, he saw one last figure standing in the hallway, watching him with a blank, empty expression. It was himself, pale and motionless, trapped, staring at him with hollow eyes as though he'd left part of his soul behind. The elevator jolted and began to ascend. Jack slumped against the wall, his heart hammering, his mind reeling from what he'd just seen. The doors finally opened, and he stumbled out, back in the hospital lobby, the cold dawn light streaming through the broken windows. He staggered outside, breathing in the fresh air, desperate to leave it all behind. But as he walked away, he felt something heavy in his pocket. He reached inside and pulled out an old rusted key with the number 13 etched into it, smeared with something dark. He froze, staring at it, the whispers still echoing faintly in his mind. And from that day forward, no matter where he went, no matter how far he tried to run, he could feel it. The sensation of eyes watching him from the shadows and the faint, incessant whispering calling him back to the forgotten floor. The storm that night was violent, roaring through the forest as if possessed, battering the old cabin and shaking the trees with a fury that seemed almost sentient. Sam and Marie had rented the cabin for a peaceful getaway, a chance to unplug and reconnect. They had laughed about the isolated location at first, but by the second night, with the storm tearing through the night, they began to wonder if coming here had been a mistake. As the rain pounded the roof, Marie noticed something odd in the corner of her eye, a faint light flickering through the trees outside. It was hard to see through the sheets of rain, but there it was, a warm glow moving between the trees as if someone were carrying a lantern. She pointed it out to Sam, who brushed it off, saying it was probably just a trick of the storm 
or a reflection from the cabin's lights. But as they sat in silence, both straining to hear above the storm, they realized they could make out faint footsteps, slow, crunching footsteps on the gravel path outside. They exchanged a glance, both suddenly feeling the hair rise on their arms. Sam moved to the window, peering through the rain-streaked glass, but there was no one there, only darkness and the dim, intermittent light bobbing farther down the trail. The footsteps continued, growing louder as they approached the cabin, and then they stopped right outside the front door. Marie's breath hitched. Did someone follow us here? She whispered, her voice barely audible over the storm. Sam shook his head, looking as confused as she felt. No one even knows we're here. Then, the doorknob rattled. Sam froze, one hand on the chair, the other reaching for the small kitchen knife he'd brought along, more for cutting apples than for any real protection. The doorknob twisted again, harder this time, and then it stopped. Silence fell, save for the storm's endless rage. But just as they began to hope whoever, or whatever, it was had gone, a slow, deliberate knock echoed through the cabin. Three loud knocks. They both jumped, staring at the door, neither daring to move. Then came another series of knocks, harder this time, more urgent, as if the visitor were becoming impatient. Maybe it's someone lost in the storm, Marie whispered, though she didn't believe it herself. No one would hike up to a remote cabin in this weather. Against his better judgment, Sam called out, Hello? Who's there? The only response was silence. Finally, Sam took a step toward the door. As he reached for the handle, a sudden wave of cold swept through the cabin, a chill so intense it felt like they'd stepped into a freezer. Marie hugged herself, teeth chattering as her breath fogged in the air. Sam's hand hovered over the doorknob, fingers trembling. He pulled the door open just a crack, peering outside. Nothing. No one on the porch, only darkness and the relentless rain. Relieved, he shut the door and turned back to Marie, but her eyes were wide, fixed on something behind him. He felt the chill again, this time so strong it seemed to seep into his bones. Slowly, he turned around. Standing in the corner of the room, just inside the door, was a shadow. Tall and vaguely human, but its face was blank, an emptiness that seemed to drink in the light around it. It didn't move, but Sam felt its presence bearing down on him, suffocating, a darkness so thick it seemed almost alive. They stood frozen, staring at the figure, too to scream, too terrified to scream, too terrified to move. And then it spoke, though its mouth never moved. Come with me. The voice was low, hollow, like wind sweeping through an abandoned house. It reverberated in their minds, a command that seemed to tug at something deep inside them. Sam felt his feet move forward, one step, then another, as if something were pulling him against his will. Marie grabbed his arm, snapping him out of the trance. No! she whispered, pulling him back. The shadow tilted its head, a movement so subtle it was almost imperceptible, and then it was gone, vanishing like smoke. The chill lifted and the storm seemed to quiet, leaving only the sound of their own shallow breaths. They didn't sleep that night, both too shaken to close their eyes. They sat together on the couch, watching the windows, half expecting to see the figure reappear. Morning finally came, a pale, weak sunlight filt filtering through the trees, and they packed up to leave, vowing never to return. As they were getting into the car, Sam glanced back at the cabin one last time. That's when he saw it. The faint outline of a handprint on the window, pressed against the glass from the inside. It was larger than any human hand, the fingers unnaturally long and thin. They drove in silence, too afraid to talk about what they'd seen. But later that night, back at home, as Marie unpacked her bag, she found something she hadn't put there. It was an old, rusted key, unlike any key she'd ever seen, with a small tag attached to it. On the tag, scrawled in faded ink, was the cabin's address and a single line written beneath it. Come back anytime. The chill returned, settling over their home like a curse. And every night after, they would hear those three knocks on their front door, louder, closer, as if the shadow were reminding them that they would never truly be alone again.